and yeah. Jamie, yeah. will people be able to see my screen? Because I was going to show them one of those medallions. Um, we'd have to, we'd, yes, you should be able to share your screen if you'd like. Yes, you should be able to. Okay, they just can't yeah. see me. But that's fine. That's right. That's right. They won't be able to see your face. Um, that's good. Can, my hair, I, I, I mean, you know, way, you know, way overdue for a haircut. Okay. <laughs> I got my COVID, uh, my, my COVID uh, um, hairdo. Good. All right, we got a good group forming already. So this is going to be a nice room tonight. Um, so we will um, we'll, we'll give it maybe 10, 15 more seconds. And then, uh, and then we'll turn it over to John for an introduction. And then I'll do a short piece and then Kim, it'll be your turn. Okay. So we've got a nice group forming. Um, so, okay. Um, John, why don't you take it away? Okay. So we're ready to roll here, huh guys? Yeah. Well, I'd like to first say welcome to everybody out there who's joining us in the greater Litchfield and Connecticut area. My name is John Markelon. I'm the current president of the Litchfield Land Trust. And it's my pleasure to start this evening by briefly introducing two special organizations in Litchfield. Uh, the Litchfield Land Trust, which I've already mentioned, we can serve and manage over 3,700 acres in, in, in the town of Litchfield and provide uh, hikers with over 12 miles of hiking trails. White Memorial, the other co-sponsor, um, which maintains over 40 miles of multiple use trails on its 4,000 acres, including access to Bantam Lake for kayaking and canoeing. So check out their websites, um, litchfieldlandtrust.org or whitememorialcc.org for more information about the trails and other activities on, within our preserves. I also wanna call your attention, uh, Litchfield Land Trust and White Memorial Conservation Center are co-sponsoring a native eco-type plant sale. And this is very, consistent with our, our, our presentation tonight. Now these kits uh, are of ecotype plants, which have been propagated from locally sourced seeds collected in our area, you know, in the greater Western Connecticut area. Now these ecotype plants are more resilient because their parent plants have, been, have adapted uh, to the local environmental conditions, you know, the, the vagaries of, of New England weather. Ecotype native plants are better for pollinators as well because they are more nutritious than non-native and invasive species. Now our plants that we're offering are arranged into kits that range from 16, 32, or 48 plugs. And they're designed to be planted in either shady or sunny conditions or locations. Now we're also selling uh, metal pollinator pathway placards or medallions that are about six inches in size. I could show you one in a second here. And they tell your neighbors that you're helping the pollinators in your yard. Now the kits and the placards can be purchased at the White Memorial website at White Memorial uh, plant and then just click on the button that says plant sale. And you can also access that from the Litchfield Land Trust uh, website. Now all kits have to be pre-ordered because there's still at the end of this COVID thing, we we're trying to do this without any physical contact of you know, cash exchange. So they all have to be pre-ordered by May 14th so that we can have them ready for um, drive up delivery at White Memorial on May 22nd, which is in uh, Litchfield, Connecticut, 80 Whitehall, Whitehall Road. So all of the proceeds from this sale will benefit Litchfield Land Trust and White Memorial Conservation Center. So Jamie, I'm not sure if you would like me to show, uh, share my screen. I could show that medallion, which I think yeah, is pretty... If you'd like to give it a try. Yeah, let's see. Uh, this will stop others from screen sharing, continue. Yeah, I, I guess I can, can do it. Um, so this this is the medallion or uh, the metal placard that we're selling as well, um, and if you buy the the largest the forty eight plug kit, you get one of these as part of the deal, anyways. 
So Jamie Fisher, I'd like to introduce for uh, the research director from White Memorial and my co-conspirator in this, in these, uh, we've been almost together for almost a year here uh, sure. doing pollinator work. And uh, Jamie, take it away. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, John. Um, and while I'm doing that, Kim, if you'd like to reshare your screen, that would be great, we'll be ready to go. Okay. Um, so it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Kimberly Stoner. Um, Dr. Stoner is a uh, agricultural scientist at the Connecticut, Connecticut's Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Science at Duke University, uh, followed by a PhD at the Cornell University in entomology. Dr. Stoner's expertise is in uh, developing alternative uh, techniques and strategies to insecticides for managing in vegetable insects. She uh, is working with organic farmers and land care professionals on pest management. And she is studying the exposure of pollinators uh, to pesticides in pollen and nectar. Uh, she has also taken on uh, the crown of co-chairing uh, the Pollinator Pathways Project, uh, which Litchfield is part of. Uh, Pollinator Pathways is a, uh, is a citizen-led conservation effort that establishes pollinator-friendly habitats and food sources for bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other uh, pollinator insects and wildlife. Uh, as you have noticed, tonight's presentation is hosted as a webinar. So you can uh, submit your questions at the end through the chat feature or the uh, Q&A feature. Um, so at this point, uh, Kim, you can just take it away. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, so is everyone seeing my screen and hearing me talk at this point? Yes, we are. Okay, good, good. I do wanna say I am not actually chairing the pollinator pathway. I um, do uh, a lot of advice and technical, uh, uh, give them a lot of technical information, um, but um, there's a, a very active group of volunteers who, who are the steering committee, and um, I am just really sort of an advisor to them. But um, anyway, um, I am, however, very interested in pollinator habitat and uh, a big supporter of the pollinator pathway. So I'm going to talk today about planting for the bees' needs and planning for the bees' needs. Um, and so uh, the focus will be mostly on native bees, but I will talk some about what's going on with honeybees. Um, and let's see, that didn't work. Let's see if this works. Oh, I can't advance the screen. There we go. Um, so the first thing I do is a land acknowledgement. So I, in New Haven, am on the traditional land of the Quinnipiac people. Um, many of the Quinnipiac people were killed, driven out, or chose to leave after colonization, but some are still here, although they are not recognized as a sovereign nation by the state or federal governments. And part of the reason that I do this is because I have belatedly realized after some years of talking about native plants and insects that these native plants and insects evolved with the native people. Um, the native people um, from various uh, groups, various tribes have lived in Connecticut for 12,500 years. So they have been managing land for all of that time. And many of our native plants were um, cultivated by the native people uh, as sources of food or fiber or other kinds of resources, medicines. And so um, I think it's just really important to acknowledge that. You may have heard talk about um, the insect apocalypse. So uh, that's what the New York Times called it. So there have been a number of studies recently really examining closely, are we losing insects on a major scale? Uh, what, uh, what groups of insects are declining? Is it the, just the rare species? Is it the common species? And there's a lot of uh, research going on right now about that. 
And I just think it's important to put bees in this context. So um, Dr. David Wagner, who is at the University of Connecticut, um, organized a symposium about this and talked about on the, on the global scale, looking at the wide range of insects, what are the causes that have, that have been involved in insect decline? Um, the ones across the top are related to climate change in some way. So uh, global warming itself, um, and then a lot of the changes in weather that are associated with global warming. So droughts, storm intensity, um, drying out forests that lead then to wildfires, uh, it changes in interaction between different species. So changes in the weather change the timing in which like, for example, specialist bees would come in contact with their plants, their, their favored plants. Um, nitrification, which is something that a lot of people don't think about, but um, the amount of nitrogen that is uh, fixed by people and put into soil and water systems is greater than the amount that is naturally fixed and put in those systems. And so that changes the soil, that changes what plants grow. Um, and because a lot of our native plants are actually adapted to low nitrogen con conditions. So that affects us directly. Then there's other forms of pollution in addition to nitrogen pollution, uh, urbanization, introduced species. A lot of people don't really think that much about how many species we move around and how that changes our ecosystem, but it's really a, a big problem. Uh, agricultural intensification, insecticides, which I will talk about some in this talk, and then deforestation. So all of these are affecting insects, um, different groups in different ways. There are always, as Dave Wagner always says in these talks, always winners and losers. So there are some species that do very well in adapting to the changes that humans make in the environment. And there are other species that are losers. Um, and we'll talk about some of them. So why do we need to protect pollinators? Um, hopefully this uh, audience that's keyed into conservation has a good idea about that. 87% of all plant species are pollinated by animals. So there's a range of different pollinators. I talk about bees, but flies are also important pollinators as are some wasps and beetles, moths, ants, bats, birds, all, uh, all kinds of things. And um, crop pollination, again, you probably are aware of this. It's critical to our food supply. Nearly all our fruits, nuts, and fruiting vegetables. Um, I'm a vegetable entomologist by background, so I pay a lot of attention to vegetables like squash, cucumbers, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Either require or benefit from insect pollinators in order to produce their yield. And then of course, insects are just an important part of the ecosystem and a source of food for other wildlife. So um, this comes from a study about how people think about different groups of insects. Um, and what I, as an entomologist learned from, from this study about what the general public think is that each group tends to have one or a few kind of iconic species and people attribute all the characteristics of that iconic species to the whole group. Um, so in the case of bees, they typically think about honeybees. As we'll talk about, honeybees are just one of the 370 or so species of bees that we have here in Connecticut. Um, and there are a lot of aspects of honeybees that are very, very different from all of our native bees. But also, you know, when people think about wasps, 
obviously the big thing they think about is stinging. And there are only certain groups of social wasps that are likely to sting. The vast majority of wasps here in Connecticut um, are solitary species that are very unlikely to sting. Uh, flies, flies are a huge and diverse group. And I think mostly what people think of are house flies, uh, which they think of as annoying and dirty. Um, but there's you know, a huge diverse group of flies. And then um, butterflies and moths, uh, in that case, they think of certain butterflies that are beautiful um, and, not, and don't really think very much about moths, many of which are not particularly distinctive looking, but are important parts of our ecosystem. And you know, so all of these groups can be important pollinators too. So dealing with some of the myths and fears, a big one I've already talked about some is stinging. So um, in the US, most stings are from yellow jackets, which are um, a small group of social wasps. Um, and the bald-faced hornet, even though it has a different name, is part of the yellow jacket group. Then there are paper wasps as well, which are another social wasp that, um, that is fairly likely to sting. Um, not as likely as yellow jackets, I would say. But um, anyway, um, so it's just a few species of social wasps. And in general, it's the social bees and wasps that are more likely to sting. Um, they have a large nest to defend. They have a large number of workers. Um, in some cases, depending on how social they are, they may have, like honeybees do, a cast of workers that are designated to defend the nest. Um, and that though they can be sacrificed to save the colony. Um, social bees, like honeybees, for example, have to defend their nest not just from people, but from other kinds of animals. So um, if you know any beekeepers, you probably know that they now have to do a lot to defend their um, honeybees from bears. And they've always had to defend them from skunks. And um, so there are other vertebrates that also attack those nests. And so social bees and wasps needed to have evolved to defend themselves against vertebrates including us. So then the solitary bees and wasps generally do not sting um, unless um, you're an entomologist catching them in a net or you're trapping them in your clothing. Um, some of the solitary bees don't even have venom. So what it means to be a solitary bee or wasp is that each female makes her own nest. Um, so um, we'll talk more about what those nests might look like um, as we go forward. Some of the solitary bees and wasps, wasps nest in aggregations, but this does not make them more likely to sting. And then only female bees and wasps sting. So um, a stinger is a modified ovipositor. And so um, in this group, it's only the females that can sting. So to talk a little bit about honeybees, I think you probably all know that they're important pollinators of crop plants, in large part because they can be, they live in, can be, and they can live in hives that can be moved, that can be moved to crops that are grown on large acreages and blooming for a short time. So um, in late February and early March, in California, there's an enormous um, area, which is a huge monocrop of almonds and beekeepers travel all over the country in order to pollinate almonds. And we would not probably have almonds um, in the abundance that we have them without honeybees being moved there because the ex agricultural intensification is such that there's um, there are too many almond trees all blooming at the same time. 
for the native pollinators to be able to pollinate. Honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought here um, pretty much as soon as the Europeans got here, um, around 1622, uh, and valued for their wax as well as for their honey. And so they were brought here um, and they pretty quickly um, swarmed and spread uh, across the country as, well as the Europeans spread across the country. So um, a lot of people want to know how honeybees are doing. And it's tough to be a beekeeper. So beekeepers continue to lose a lot of honeybee colonies um, every year. So you can see this graph with the percentage of honeybee colonies lost. Um, this comes from a survey of beekeepers that's done every year. And you can see that for quite some time, the annual losses have been about 40%. So that's, that's big to replace 40% of your colonies every year. And so it costs a lot of labor and expenses in buying new queens and packages of bees and building them up year after year. But Honeybees are not going to disappear. Um, in spite of what I see in many uh, of the social media, um, so um, honeybees have the number of colonies in the United States has remained fairly steady over the last twenty-five years. This is an old graph that only goes up to twenty twelve, but um, I've looked up the data from the same source, uh, the National Agricultural Statistics Survey, Service, excuse me, National Agricultural Statistics Service. And um, so um, over time, the number of colonies has fluctuated for, um, you know, 25 years between about two and a half million and three million honeybee colonies in the United States. So, even though the beekeepers lose a lot of honeybee colonies, they continue to replace them. And part of that has to do with economics because as it's become more difficult to keep bees, um, the, the price that beekeepers can charge for pollination services has gone up so that it remains economically viable um, and so um, as long as the economics continue to work, the beekeepers continue to maintain a certain number of colonies in the United States. The biggest problem for the beekeepers is um, really a pandemic that's been going on in honeybees now for um, over 25 years. So uh, these mites, uh, the varroa mites, and the viruses that they transmit. So um, these mites very effectively transmit a virus that's called the deformed wing virus. And they also transmit some other viruses. But the deformed, ring, the deformed wing virus has really adapted to being transmitted and with the varroa mites. And so there's like a synergism that goes on that has made this virus much worse. And that, that, that combination is really what um, is affecting honeybees the most. But there are lots of other factors. Many of the other factors that affect other bees also affect honeybees. So how are honeybees different from all of our native bees? So as I said, they're not native here. Uh, the genus Apis, um, honeybees are Apis mellifera. Uh, the genus Apis evolved in Asia. Um, the species Apis mellifera, mellifera may have lived in Europe for 300,000 years and then was brought here by European settlers. Um, they live in these giant colonies with tens of thousands of workers and the colonies persist over a period of years. So unlike 
the vast majority of insects, they don't go dormant in the winter. They overwinter as a tight cluster of workers and queen. They keep the temperature up. So one of the reasons why beekeepers have to leave a certain number of pounds of honey in the hive is for the bees to be able to consume it through the winter and essentially burn it with their metabolism in order to keep the temperature up through the winter and raise the temperature in February when the queen starts laying eggs and they start to raise the brood. They reproduce as a colony. So there, um, there isn't really such a thing as an individual honeybee that lives on its own. Um, the queen only leaves the colony for a short time in order to go out and mate, and then she comes back to the colony for the rest of her life. And so when the colonies reproduce, there's like an entire colony that buds off, that can have like 10,000 bees in it, a swarm that flies off with um, the old queen and uh, a new queen that's been produced by the colony when then stays with the, um, in the hive typically. So um, a very unusual way of reproducing. And as you may know, they have an elaborate system of communication in the colony. So the scout bees go out and find nectar and pollen sources and they do this waggle dance to communicate to the foragers where to go to find food. Um, again, a very unusual uh, behavior that honeybees have. But um, as I have said, there's more to bees than honeybees. So um, there are bumblebees and uh, sweat bees. There's a green sweat bee and then um, another sweat bee in the genus Helictus here in this picture. And um, honeybees are not the only bees that pollinate our crops. So um, we will have apples blooming shortly, um, probably this week sometime. Um, and honeybees uh, are an important pollinator of apples. A lot of apple growers do rent honeybee hives. Um, so in the in this series of pie graphs, the light blue slice of the pie is how much of the of the pollination actually technically the visitation to the flowers is done by each group of bees. So the light blue is honeybees, the dark blue is bumblebees. There aren't that many bumblebees out at this point because at this point there are only queens, um, carpenter bees. And then in this study, um, she just classified the other groups of bees as medium and small. We'll see uh, some of the groups of bees that are in those categories. So then as you go through this season, uh, bumblebees become more important um, as pollinators. So um, they, uh, they are 23% of the pollinators for blueberries, 30% for raspberries and blackberries, that's what caneberries are. 34% overall for the cucurbits. I actually studied pollination in squash and bumblebees were um, far more important. They were uh, two thirds of the, of the visitors to squash and pumpkins. So in Connecticut, as I've mentioned, we have about 370 species. Uh, my te technician, Tracy Zarillo, is working on the checklist of the bees. And so she's got about 15 more species that she's checking the records and checking the taxonomy to make sure everything's been appropriately identified. Um, but at, at a minimum, we have 370 species of bees in Connecticut. We have 41 genera, so that's the next category up. So like for Apis mellifera, Apis is the genus and mellifera is the species. Um, so we have one species of honeybee. Um, we historically had 16 species of bumblebees. I'll talk some about that. Um, 12 species of calides, which are cellophane bees, and I'll show you some pictures of those. 
19 species of mason beans, and I'll show you pictures of those too, and 83 species of andrina, which are deer bees. So um, uh, then all of those groups I just mentioned, uh, the cellophane bees, the mason bees, and the digger bees are all groups of solitary bees. The sweat bees, um, which are called sweat bees because um, some of them will land on people and drink a little drop of sweat, probably to get some uh, minerals from our sweat. Most of them are solitary. Some of them are social. Some of them are parasitic. They're a very large and very diverse group. As you can see, we have 76 species of those that we know of. That's actually a group that Tracy is working on some of. At least 79 species of bees that are parasitic on other bees. So uh, part of what makes bees bees, um, at least in this part of the world, is that they use pollen as their source of protein, but not all bees collect pollen. Some bees get their pollen as a source of protein by uh, sneaking into the nests of other bees. So I'll talk some more about that. And that doesn't add up to 370 species. So we have other species, mostly solitary bees. So we have been trapping be, uh, bees at White Memorial for um, a number of years. We are not all caught up in identifying all the bees we've trapped at White Memorial, but we have just a little array of bee bowls. Um, so um, uh, traps, that are different colors, yellow, blue, and white, um, that um, just attract the bees as by looking like flowers, and then they get caught in the fluid that we put in the bowls. And um, just in those bowls, um, so not trying to go out and catch a lot of bees you know, on flowers, just like seeing what comes to these passive traps. We have 65 species in 18 genera that we've caught at the White Memorial. So we've caught some honeybees. We've caught five species of bumblebees. They actually don't like bee bowls very much. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot more species of bumblebees than that at White Memorial. We've got one species of cellophane bee, which may be because we start a little too late perhaps for some of the really early cellophane bees. Um, Three species of mason bees. They actually don't like bee bowls very much either. Uh, 13 species of digger bees, 22 species of sweat bees, 11 species that are just nest parasites of other bees and more. So, um, so you know, even with this fairly limited sampling at White Memorial, we have quite a diversity of different bees there. So to talk about different groups of bees, so um, bumblebees, most people recognize what bumblebees look like. Um, so uh, there, as I mentioned, we historically had 16 species of bumblebees in Connecticut. Um, one species, well, actually two species, Bombus affinus, which is the common name is the rusty patched bumblebee. So you may know it under that name. That B is um, probably extirpated from the state. It hasn't been found here, as you can see, since 1997. And um, it's a federally endangered species. Um, there are some populations still in existence in the upper Midwest and some in the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia and Virginia. Um, maybe a little in Maryland, but um, they haven't been seen here in a long time. And this used to be a common bee. Um, I've talked to uh, Dr. Askins, who taught an ecology course at Conn College and you know, used to like have his students look at what this bee was visiting all the time. That was like you know, one of the common bees that they studied. Um, so it's, but it looks like it's gone. Bombus ashtoni is actually a species that um, is mostly parasitic on Bombus affinis. So it is likely gone as well. 
um, Bombus Tericola um, had a big crash at the same time that Bombus Affinus crashed, but seems to be making a comeback. So um, we first heard that it was making a comeback in the Northern New England in, in Maine and New Hampshire. And we went out looking in the Northwest corner of Connecticut and we found that it has returned. So, um, so that's actually good news. Um, there are some others that are not state listed bees that we have not found for a long time. And I can tell you that we have collected an awful lot of bumblebees and looked for an awful lot of bumblebees. So there are ones that we're very concerned about. Um, one of them is, is Bombus pennsylvanicus. And across the country, there, um, there's some controversy about it, but there seems to have been a lot of decline of Bombus pennsylvanicus. And another one that um, is supposed to be increasing in the Northeast, according to this paper that was published in 2013, is Bombus citrinus, which was last seen in 2010. Um, that's the last time we collected it in Eastern Connecticut. Um, and uh, so we're wondering what happened to that one. That is actually a bee that's parasitic on uh, Bombus impatiens, which is a very common uh, widespread bee. Um, so it's not clear what would have happened to Bombus citrinus. So we'll have to figure that out. So the life cycle of bumblebees. Um, uh, so bumblebees, unlike honeybees, uh, don't overwinter as a colony. It's just the mated queens who overwinter. So each um, mated queen finds a little space to overwinter, typically in the ground. Um, and um, she doesn't have any kind of food stored like a honeybee. She doesn't have any honey stored. All the food she lives on is what she's got stored in her fat body inside her body. So um, when she comes out um, and she needs to forage to build up her energy, she needs to get nectar. Then she also needs to get pollen in order to stimulate her ovaries and get some protein. Um, and then she looks for places to make her nest. And that's actually, you'll see um, bumblebees zigzagging back and forth um, over the ground at this time of year, often looking for places to make their nests. Once she finds a place to make a nest, then um, she secretes wax to make it waterproof. Um, she uh, builds the nest. She uh, goes out and forages for uh, pollen to feed her larvae because larvae need a lot of protein in order to develop and pollen is the source of protein. And then um, she starts, when she starts to lay eggs and the larvae develop, then she, she actually incubates the larvae. So the picture at the top is a bumblebee queen pressing her abdomen against the larvae and she heats up her abdomen with her metabolism so that the larvae will develop faster. And for this, she actually can store a tiny amount, about a thimbleful, which is what you see in that picture, about a thimbleful of honey um, so that um, she has enough honey to tide her over when the weather is bad for a day or two. Um, but she can't store a large amount of honey like a honeybee. Then um, as the colony grows, uh, and a, the first cohort of workers um, develop to adulthood, then she becomes more like a honeybee queen. She stays in the nest. The workers go out and do the foraging. Um, they maintain the nest. Um, and so then the colony can expand through the summer. Um, in a good year, the colony might get to be 400 workers, something like that. And then at the end of the summer, the um, males are produced and new queens are produced by the colony. The queens and the males mate 
And then it's just the overwintering mated queens. Those are the only ones who survive the winter. All the males and all the other workers die off at the, um, at the end of the year. So that's the life cycle. And um, a lot of people are interested in creating habitat for bumblebees. And this group of people in England um, did a lot of research, some really elegant research about um, how to create habitat, which actually increases the pollinators, the, in particular, the bumblebees. And what they found is that you have to supply all the different stages of the bumblebee life cycle. So um, they need to have nectar. And the most critical period, as you might've guessed from the life cycle, is early in the season when the queens first come out of hibernation and they're establishing their nests and they're incubating the larvae. And so those sources of nectar are typically spring blooming trees and shrubs. So a lot of people think of pollinator habitat as just being like perennial plants that bloom in the summer, but the um, trees and shrubs are really important for bumblebees and for a lot of the other bees as well. Um, and then uh, again, in the late summer and the early fall, when the new queens are storing energy in their fat bodies in order to make it through the winter. And then to build up the colony through the course of the summer, then they need sources of nutritious pollen. Um, and um, so that's when a lot of the herbaceous plants come in, a lot of those summer blooming herbaceous plants. And they need nesting habitat, and the different species have different preferred nesting habitats. Most of them are underground, uh, but and and often in in abandoned nests of like mice or chipmunks. But some of them are in bird nests, um, and some species prefer forests. Some species prefer meadows. We don't know enough about where the queens are spending the winter. Um, and of course, they need protection from pesticides, particularly insecticides. So the life cycle of solitary bees. So as I said, a solitary bee is a bee where each female makes her own nest. So um, in this example, uh, life cycle from the Xerxes Society, um, we are talking about a ground nesting solitary bee so um, typically the solitary bees spend the vast majority of the year in some kind of overwintering stage. So it's different for different bees. In this example, it's the pupa that would be spending all but about six to eight weeks of the year in the nesting material in the ground in this case. Um, some, some bees, the overwintering stage is a pre-pupa. Some of them do part of their overwintering as an adult. Um, so it's different for different bees. But anyway, so um, the bee uh, becomes an adult, emerges from the nesting material at some particular time of year based on temperature and uh, maybe light in some cases. Um, and uh, typically the males emerge first and then the females, uh, they mate, um, they get their energy from nectar, um, and then the females collect pollen, then they need to collect pollen for themselves, um, again, to stimulate their ovaries so that they can lay eggs. Then they also, but they also need to collect a mixture of nectar and pollen as food for the larvae. So for these solitary bees, in this case, ground nesting, the female would make a tunnel in the ground um, and then she would make a little cell. So the little pocket that you see off of the tunnel, she stocks that with a provision, which is a mixture of nectar and pollen. 
And now just recently, there have been some papers that say the, the, the nectar and pollen may not be the only source of food. It might be actually the microbes feeding on the nectar and pollen that are, are a large part of the food that the larvae eats, which is really interesting. Anyway, she stocks the cell, she lays an egg on the provision, and then she closes off the cell. So there's no maternal care the way there is in honeybees and um, some bumblebees. Um, and then the egg hatches, the larva develops to whatever is the overwintering stage and then overwinters. So the, the adult is only out, the female adult is only out for like six to eight weeks. Um, and then the vast majority of the time uh, in the life cycle is spent in, in some kind of resting stage um, once the larva has developed to that stage. Um, in the nesting material. So here is an example, um, the cellophane bees. So we have 12 species of cellophane bees. They're called that because they line their nests with a material that's kind of like cello cellophane. Uh, they're solitary ground nesting bees. Um, these bees often nest in aggregations. Um, and a really common one is uh, Calides inequalis, which uh, comes out in late March. And we get calls at the experiment station when people see aggregations of these solitary bees. One reason they see them is because it's late March, it's before the grass grows. And so people can actually see the nests. And people call and they um, are afraid of these bees, but these are solitary bees they um, they are really unlikely to sting. I mean, I have you know taken lots of pictures of them and and dug up their nests and done all kinds of things, and they I've never been stung by them. And they're very cute bees, as you can see. Um, another group of solitary bees, um, actually three different genera, um, are in the family Megachylidae. Um, and so probably the ones you're most familiar with are the mason bees, which are the genus Osmia. And um, so uh, many of these are cavity nesting bees. And so these are the bees that people build bee hotels for. Um, and though they're called mason bees because they um, block off each cell in the tunnel with um, a little bit of mud. Um, and so that's, uh, but there are other bees that are leaf cutters that use leaves or other kinds of plant material to block off their, their cells in the tunnel. Um, these are important pollinators of uh, several different kinds of, of fruit trees. And then there's a species um, that is a specialist on, um, well, it's not really a specialist, but those were brought here to pollinate alfalfa. It was actually brought here from elsewhere in the world to pollinate alfalfa. Um, so bee hotels, I have very mixed feelings about bee hotels. Um, a lot of the bee hotels are poorly designed. Um, and so they, um, they may not actually get bees nesting in them. And then um, when you do have well enough designed bee hotels so that the bees nest in them, you also need to maintain the bee hotels or else they can get full of diseases. In particular, there's a fungal disease. Um, there are parasites, there are predators like uh, woodpeckers that, um, that can feed on these bee hotels. So in nature, these um, mason bees uh, would be nesting in naturally occurring tunnels in wood or um, other kinds of, of spaces like that that are not gonna be a huge number altogether in one place. So um, as you know, we're all aware these days with the pandemic, when you get a huge number of organisms together in one place, 
and there are pathogens about, then the pathogens are more likely to spread. So, um, uh, so you know, I think that B hotels can be a good opportunity for people to observe these very interesting bees, but they have to be designed properly and maintained properly or else um, they're not really doing the bees any good. So um, Andrina bees, which are called, some people call them minor bees, some people call them digger bees. We have 83 species in Connecticut. Uh, these are all ground nesting. They're all solitary. They don't typically have any venom. Um, and because they have a short period of activity, uh, again, solitary bees have like six to eight weeks of activity. Um, many of them are plant specialists because um, they um, can survive, they can feed their larvae. That's what it means for a bee to be a plant specialist is that they have a restricted uh, group, maybe one genus, maybe just a few genera of plants that they collect pollen from in order to feed their larvae. So they might feed on other kinds of flowers for nectar, but, um, but the larvae need to be fed on pollen from a particular plant. Um, so uh, this is from a study that was done in New York State looking at apple, apple pollinators. Um, and you can see that the mining bees, the genus Andrina, was about half of the bees visit, visiting apple trees. And, there, and some of these apple growers actually had honeybees, um, honeybee colonies. So you can see that they had a pretty substantial number of honeybees as well. And then these other groups um, also were contributing to pollinating apples. I've already talked about many solitary bees are specialists. This is actually a picture of a bee that is a specialist on the genus Cucurbita, which is pumpkins and squash. So this bee feeds its larvae only pollen from uh, pumpkins and squash. So do native bees need native plants? Um, so some bees are generalists. Um, the social bees, generally have to be specialists. I mean, not specialists, generalists, have to be generalists because they have colonies that they have to maintain over a long season. So they have to be able to adapt to different groups of plants. But um, solitary bees, some of them um, can specialize on just a native genus or a few genera. Others of them may have a wider range. And so it's not like a yes or no question as well, whether you're a specialist or a generalist. Um, so some of them have uh, different ranges of generalization, but they are all active only for a short time, the solitary bees. So these are some examples of New England plant genera that have bees that specialize on those plants. Um, so goldenrod, goldenrod is just a great plant for all kinds of flower visitors, including 11 species, 11 specialist species of bees, lots of other bees besides, and lots of wasps and lots of other things. Um, the, the asters like New, New England aster, they are now classified in the Symphiotrichum genus. Uh, but New England aster, New York aster, those asters have seven species. Um, Lysimachia, which is uh, not to be confused with purple loosestrife, but a uh, different, uh, different group. They have a few bees. Sunflowers, some of the other goldenrods, ground cherries. But also, you know, as I've said before, it's not just the, the herbaceous plants. The, trees and shrubs like willows and blueberries, um, some of the um, lionia and uh, hibiscus has a really cool bee that specializes on it. So, um, uh, so trees and shrubs as well as uh, the 
uh, perennials are important. Sweat bees, we've talked about a little bit, um, a very large, diverse group, small bees, but a large, a large group of bees, lots of different species. Um, and um, very abundant, very common bees. And um, some of them are social, some of them are solitary. And as I've mentioned too, some bees are parasitic. So some bees, rather than collecting pollen to feed their own young, the females will sneak into the nests of other bees like cuckoos do among the birds and lay their eggs on the provisions collected by the host bee species. Um, there are lots of different groups that are parasitic. Um, they can have, be parasites on social or solitary bees. Um, some uh, uh, parasites attack other bees in the same genus, like the parasitic bumblebees that attack other bumblebees. Um, and then there are genera that are all parasites, like uh, the nomada, which are all parasitic on Andrina. And um, so the female sneaks in and lays her egg and the larvae hatches out and the larvae has to kill off the larvae of the other bees. So there are some parasitic bee larvae with some mean mandibles for doing that work. So to talk some about pesticides, um, uh, you know, bees are insects and so it's hard to have a broad spectrum insecticide that is not gonna be very toxic to bees. So mostly what you have to do is just make sure that you're not using insecticides in a way that's gonna affect bees. One of the big problems, and you may have heard of this from environmental groups, uh, one of the big problems is neonicotinoids. So these are insecticides that are systemic, they travel in the plant, and they can be used in lots of different ways. But the big problem in my view is that they are used in seed treatments on an enormous, enormous scale in the US. So there are more acres in the US treated with neonicotinoids than for any other insecticide in history. And you can see that a huge amount of it is used on corn, which is maize, that's the scientific word for corn, and soybeans. Um, and uh, in Indiana, for example, where my mother still has a farm, um, you typically get a rotation where people grow corn and then they grow soybeans and then they grow corn and all of those seeds are treated with neonicotinoids. Um, the neonicotinoids break down very slowly. Um, so um, they can build up in soil. Uh, and uh, then several studies have questioned whether there's any economic benefit because it's become really kind of the default that when a farmer, other than an organic farmer, buys corn seed, it's all gonna be treated with neonicotinoids. And whenever we use any kind of pesticide on that kind of scale, then you get blowback, you get negative effects on the insect natural enemies, and you get pests that are resistant because they're exposed to the same pesticides all the time. And another big problem, um, as I've mentioned, they can build up in soil, uh, very little of the neonicotinoids used in the seed actually gets into the plant. A lot of it ends up staying in the soil or leaching out into the water. Um, so they're water soluble. That's part of what makes them systemic, able to travel in the plant. And so they end up in the waterways. They end up in the plants in the field margins. Um, actually, some of them are being banned in Canada not because of their effects on pollinators, but because of their effects on aquatic insects. And then as we've talked about, a lot of bees nest in the ground. So when you have these pesticides that build up in soil, what does it do to soil nesting 
bees. And so this is a great study just recently by Susan Chan looking at um, the squash bee. Um, so people do use neonicotinoids in squash and they also use them in corn. And this bee likes to make its nests in cultivated soil. So oftentimes the nests are in corn fields um, as well as in squash fields. And um, so um, that's another possible route by which bees are being exposed to these pesticides. So in general, you wanna minimize pesticide use. You wanna use what entomologists call integrated pest management. So you wanna use the least amount needed at the time and location where it will be the most effective. You don't wanna apply it to plants in bloom because that's where bees will be. Um, identify honeybee hives and protect the honeybee hives. And then these systemic insecticides actually for the most part are not available to homeowners because they're restricted use pesticides. They're still used by farmers. They can still be used by landscapers, people who have pesticide licenses, but they are not used by homeowners. So um, to talk some about some other pollinator habitat. So in the past, the um, rights of way um, have been great pollinator habitats. So maintaining um, early successional habitat, so low growing shrubs um, and perennial plants uh, fits in with um, maintaining electrical transmission lines. And oftentimes these go through forests. So there's um, places where there's forest right next to early successional habitat great habitat for a lot of wildlife, including bees. Um, but, um, and this is actually from a paper by uh, David Wagner, who was looking at plants and bees in uh, rights of way. And you can see there's a lot of great early successional habitat, but a lot of it is being destroyed um, uh, as, uh, Utility companies are replacing their uh, transmission towers, uh, their wooden transmission towers with steel transmission towers. They are um, doing a lot of damage and there are ways they can do this replacement without doing so much damage. But um, the landowners need to be right on top of it and make sure that they, um, use all the tools that are available to them to make sure that um, all the proper conservation techniques are used. On a more positive note, the DOT has been reducing mowing um, and allowing more native wildflowers to grow. Um, they of course have to do a certain amount of mowing in order to maintain safety, but um, uh, it saves them money, it saves them labor, and it benefits pollinators. So it's a win-win-win situation. Um, and then um, the pollinator pathway, we've talked some about the pollinator pathway. Um, so this is just a tremendous movement which has just exploded um, across this state um, in Eastern New York, in Pennsylvania, in Western Massachusetts, all over to connect um, natural areas with um, ordinary people um, uh, and uh, groups like uh, land trusts and watershed associations to create pollinator habitat and create corridors for the pollinators. And um, you can also create pollinator habitat in your own yard. This is actually my house um, with my yard, um, which has become actually uh, pretty widely publicized lately. It was just on television. It's been in Connecticut Magazine. Um, so uh, I've done my best to get rid of the lawn altogether so that I don't have to mow. And I have vegetable beds where I, and fruit trees and bushes blooming, which are good for pollinators and also 
a lot of native flowering plants that are good for pollinators. And so this is my next campaign is to get people, once you've gotten rid of your lawn, then you can leave the leaves and um, they become mulch. And um, so uh, then you save yourself lots of work um, and you uh, create mulch, create soil, create habitat, and um, you can save on buying all those leaf bags and save the uh, municipal workers who pick up the leaves from having to do all that and then figure out what to do that with them. So I'm a big fan of the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They have lots more information. So I would encourage you to check them out. Um, you can check out my page at the Experiment Station website, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station website, um, and it's called Pollinator Information. And um, you know, just to review, native trees and shrubs, native herbaceous perennials, lots of diversity um, to have at least three species in flower through the whole growing season, um, larval host plants for moths and butterflies. So they, their larvae don't live on pollen, they live on um, other kinds of plant material, including leaves. And so you need to, uh, you need to have the plants that they feed on, reduce your use of pesticides, providing nesting habitat. Um, and then, you know, diverse flowering plants with little or no pesticide use, um, and anything is better than a lawn or pavement. So that is uh, the talk. Um, and um, I've gone a little bit over an hour, so I don't know if there are any questions or um, anything that I need to do. Well, thank you, Kim. That was filled with some great information. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot and I'm sure that our participants did as well. So um, please, uh, I'm gonna encourage everyone, our, all of our attendees to, um, to type in some, uh, some questions in the chat feature or the Q&A feature. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to field them for uh, Dr. Stoner. Um, and, but it, 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 those take home messages were really important. I think Kim, the, the planting three, having three flowering plants throughout the growing season uh, is really important. And it seems like there's a real need for making sure that there's um, some early flowering species as well as some late flowering species uh, to prepare the, to prepare the, the bees for the, for the winter. Um, do you have any favorites in the early, since we're entering early spring, do you have any favorites for very early spring flowering plants that seem to work really well at this time of year? So, um, I have uh, right now in bloom in my yard, golden Alexanders, which are um, Zizia aurea is the scientific name for them. Um, and um, they're, they're great. And they actually have some specialist bees as well. Um, uh, then um, my, I'm, I'm, in a warmer climate than you are, <laughs> um, yeah. but um, I my dogwood has just come into flower, um, and uh, so that's great. And that also has a specialist bee. Um, let's see, what are some other things? Flocks. There are native flocks uh, species that are also in flower here. Um, so great. yeah, um, great. All of those, and you know. Dandelions are not native, but they do actually produce a lot of pollen and they do get quite a lot of visitation from bees. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, our, our plant kits have, uh, have the uh, golden Alexandris in them. Uh, some of our plant kits have them, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely some, some room to expand depending on whether people would like um, a flowering tree or shrub um, and, um, and so forth. Uh, we did get one question here from uh, Mary Lou. Uh, or her question is, are, are organic pesticide treatments harmful to bees? So um, 
the organic pesticides that are broad spectrum um, also affect bees. So um, things like um, pyrethrum or pyrethrins, um, those are toxic to bees. Um, there are organic materials that are not toxic to bees, um, like um, Bacillus thuringiensis. So it goes under the trade name of Dipel is one of the trade names for it. Um, that is um, derived, it's like a, a protein that's derived from a bacterium that binds to the gut of caterpillars. So um, it, um, it uh, is pretty specific to caterpillars. There's another one that's um, Bacillus israelensis, which is actually what's in mosquito dunks. So if you get those, um, uh, you can get it as a powder or you can get it as little donuts that you put in mm -hmm. uh, your water, like my uh, rain barrel. I use mosquito dunks in my rain barrel to um, kill the mosquito larvae. And that is another protein that's specific to the guts of um, mosquitoes and other uh, diptera uh, that are related to mosquitoes. So those are not toxic to bees at all. Um, uh, so, you know, it depends on sort of how broad spectrum they are really. Yeah, that, that was, that's great. Um, didn't know about the mosquito dunks uh, being specific to mosquitoes. Oh, that's great. Um, we also have another question uh, from Anique. Uh, she, would, she would like to know, how come it is so difficult to find someone, assign somebody knowledgeable in honey beekeeping since honeybees are so crucial for us? So maybe that's the question is about beekeepers in general. Why is it so difficult to become a beekeeper, to find a beekeeper? Um, and as a, as a profession and a hobby, why, why is it so difficult to, to sort of maintain our beekeeping community? So um, there's actually quite a lot of practical knowledge involved in learning how to keep bees. And there are beekeeping organizations across the state. So um, there's the Connecticut Beekeeping Association, um, there's the Backyard Beekeepers. Um, those are the ones that are in uh, Western Connecticut. There's one in Eastern Connecticut as well. All of those groups have um, uh, classes to teach people about how to keep bees. Um, every year around February, they have, um, uh, they have a whole series of, of classes to teach people. Um, but uh, you can't really learn how to keep bees in the course of like a class and buying a book. What you really have to do is find a beekeeper mentor and work with a beekeeper for at least a year so that you see the entire yearly cycle of how to keep bees. Um, so it requires a lot of of um, practical information. Uh, a lot of people want to keep bees. Um, the classes, I, I don't know if it's still true, but I know a few years ago, the classes um, were, well, I guess because of the pandemic, probably that's, they haven't been so big, but they, we used to have like huge numbers of people like, filling our auditorium, taking these classes um, to learn how to become beekeepers. Um, but a lot of them find it really challenging, partly because of this issue of um, the varroa mites and the viruses, um, and partly just because it takes a lot of knowledge and experience to become a good beekeeper. Sure. Yeah, everyone around here started raising chickens. I had more more people raising chickens near me than I've ever seen before, <laughs> um, and uh, and I we we were we're planning on reopening the museum soon, and so we had to reorder our package for the observation hive, and we're having a really tough, a little bit of trouble trying to find a packet, ordering a package because they're selling out so fast this year. So I'm wondering if beaky honeybees are turning into the next uh, turning into the next chickens 
I think it's been actually going on for a while, actually. Yeah. That, um, but I think also um, the people who raise packages also have to deal with these mites and viruses and all that yeah. kind of thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I don't see any more questions coming over. Um, John, I, I don't know if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask, but I'd like to encourage everyone to visit whitememorialcc.org um, to check out the plant sale uh, and to uh, see if there's a kit there that suits your, your yard or your garden so that you can convert some lawn space to become a, um, to, to foster some bees and other pollinators in your own yard. Um, so John, do you have any questions that you might want to ask? No, I just wanted to follow up on what you said. Uh, not only do we have our pack, some of our kits contain the ZZF, but we, we try to follow uh, Kim's uh, great advice, which is to distribute the, their flowering availability throughout the growing season to, to the greatest extent possible. Um, so yeah, yeah but John, oh, it was very, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say you did a great job, John, in designing those kits uh, to optimize that uh, that flowering phenology uh, throughout the season. So that that I think there was a lot of work and a lot of planning that went into it, and it follows uh, it follows a lot of what uh, Kim was saying in her presentation. So that's great. Um, so with that, everyone, uh, it's we, we've been running for about an hour and fifteen minutes. So I think it's a good time to to depart. If you have any questions, feel free to email uh, Kim. Uh, her email is up there on the on the screen and um, we'll have this uh, video posted online and we'll share the link with everyone so that you can share it with your friends. Thanks for attending everyone and thank you Kim. This was a great presentation. We really appreciate your help. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thank bye -bye. you Kim. Bye-bye. Have a good night.